Welcome to First Presbyterian Pine City Online. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Our prayer is that this service will inspire you to take your next step in your walk with Jesus. You can connect with us throughout the week on our Facebook page or on our website, firstpresspinecity.org, where you can also watch or listen to past messages. You'll also find opportunities to give there and help support the ministries of our church. Just go to the website and click on the appropriate button. While we are looking forward to being able to gather again in person real soon, in fact, only two weeks from this weekend, we are planning to meet for in-person worship. That's Sunday, January 31st at 10.30, our regular time. Right after that worship service, we're going to have a brief congregational meeting for our church members. If you are a member and you're unable to attend in person, you can still connect uh, via the Zoom app or by phone. You just need to let us know in advance so that we can get you the logon information. Well, as we begin our service this morning, I want to invite you to take a few moments just to open your heart to what God wants to say to you today. I came across a song this week that really spoke to me, and I want to share that with you. And as you listen to the song, just use this time to worship our Savior and remember that in the midst of a world that is in turmoil, we never have to fear because Jesus reigns.
Father, we thank you that you reign over all. And now we ask that you would make us open to what you want to say to us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're in our second week of our series, Better, and as we said last week, I think we can all agree that we want this year to be better than last year. And this year can be better than last year, but it's going to require something from us that we don't generally like. We're going to have to change some things. We don't usually like change, do we? Really, the only person who likes change is a wet baby. But if we want this year to be better, we're going to have to change some things. We're going to have to do some things differently. If we just keep doing what we've always been doing, we're going to keep getting the same results. Not only this year, but next year and the year after that. Is there a way to have a better year? Well, yes, there is, but it's going to require a bit of honest evaluation. And it might be awkward. And it's going to require a bit of honest and awkward contemplation and even some honest and awkward transparency, maybe with another person. Substantial change for the better doesn't usually just happen. We have to decide that we're going to change and then figure out what it is that needs to change. Last week, we talked about the, the power of consistency, that consistency over time is far more effective than intensity. But consistency, especially in an area of weakness, requires a strength that we just can't find in ourselves. And at the end of last week, I left you with a simple prayer that you can pray every day. And it's just this, Lord, I need you. Please give me your strength for today. And I hope you've been praying that prayer every day. I know it's made a difference for me, and I'm confident it will for you as well. Well, today, I want us to look at a different question in regard to change. And this was kind of inspired by a message I heard from Pastor Andy Stanley. So I want to thank him for the outline for today's talk. Now, when I started running a few years ago, one of the things I realized early on is that the left, less stuff that I'm carrying with me, the faster I can go and the further I can go. And if I want to go further faster, I need to jettison anything that I don't absolutely need to carry with me. And some of that was just extra me. You know, losing weight was a big help as I started running. And, and fortunately, running actually helped me with that. But the other thing was just wearing as, as little clothing as possible. Like when I run, I, I want to get the lightest shoes. I want to get the lightest shorts and the lightest shirt that I can. And, and that's it. I don't want to carry any other excess stuff. That's why I don't really love running in the winter in Minnesota because I have to put on layer after layer of shirts and, and a hat and gloves and jacket. and Well, you, you kind of get the picture, which is, is really necessary when it's 20 below out. And I'm not fast anyway, but having all that extra clo clothing just really slows me down even more. I'm, I'm registered to run Grandma's Marathon in Duluth again this June. 
and I'm not running for time, but I want to at least complete it, you know, and I want to do a decent job and hopefully even better than last year. So you can be sure that I'm not going to be wearing all my winter gear, even if it ends up snowing. And I know it's June, but this is Minnesota, you know. Which leads me to the question that I want us to take a look at today. And I'm going to put this question to you several, several different ways to kind of really get us to dig in and think about it. And here's the question that I want to ask you as you think, uh, think about how you want to embark on this brand new year. And that's just this. What is it that's holding you back? What, what are you holding on to that's holding you back? What are you holding on to that's actually, like, if you're honest, it has a hold on you. And what are you holding on to that has a hold on you that people around you who love you secretly or maybe not so secretly wish that you would let go of? What's weighing you down because you refuse to let it go? And maybe initially you thought this would make your life better, but actually it's just made your life more complicated. What is it that's slowing you down? What's slowing you down because you just won't put it down? You just won't acknowledge it and let it go? What are you holding on to that you kind of feel compelled to keep hidden? You just don't want her to ever find out or you don't want him to ever find out. You don't want them to find out. And if your kids knew, you'd be just humiliated. If they found out at work, like, or if your friends knew, or if your parents knew, if they found out, you would be so humiliated. But you keep dragging this thing around, hoping nobody's going to find out. Let me ask it one final way. What are you holding on to that's making a monkey out of you? Because this is, in fact, how you trap a monkey. Let me explain that to you. You take a large coconut, you hollow it out and tie it to a tree. Then you place a banana in the coconut. And the monkey sticks their hand into the coconut, grabs the banana, and refuses to let it go. That's how you trap a monkey. And you don't really trap the monkey this way. The monkey actually traps itself. But as you'll discover if you look this up, not all monkeys can be trapped this way. There's only a certain kind of monkey that can be trapped this way. The monkey that lacks the intelligence to let go of the banana. So if you fall asleep or your internet goes out, here's the bottom line for today's message. Here it is, ready? Let go of the banana and run away, okay? Just say this out loud, wherever you're listening to this, ready? Let go of the banana and run away. It's really that simple. But it's not that simple, is it? Well, it, it is simple, but it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy, because if it was easy, you would have already done it. But the concept is simple enough. Let go of the banana and run away. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, that's pretty much all I have for you today, okay? Like, you can just take it from there yourself. You just got to identify what it is you're holding on to, realize it's costing you at home, it's costing you financially, it's costing you in terms of what's happening to your body, it's costing you, and, and you just need to pull an Elsa, let it go, and you just need to walk away. You take it from there, it's up to you, it's your life. If you're not a Jesus follower, you can just kind of take this practical application and run with it, okay? But before you do that, I want to add one thing. It's possible that whatever it is that you're holding on to, that, that you're dragging around, you're not just hurting yourself. By holding on, you're actually holding off the people who love you the most and the people that you love the most. It's damaging your closest relationships and it's keeping you from moving forward. Here's the deal. The people around you who are closest to you, they kind of already know what it is. And they may have tried to talk to you about it before, but you got so defensive that they haven't brought it up. So you think they've forgotten it or you think they, they just don't notice it. They haven't forgotten. They notice. They just don't want to face your defensiveness. So as you consider this, if you realize over the course of the next few minutes that, yeah, you're holding on to something that's holding you back, for the sake of the people that you love and for the sake of the people that love you, would you just let it go? Now, ultimately, of course, I'd love for you to consider following Jesus. Because as we said last week, following Jesus will actually make your life better. And it will make you better at life. 
Now, if you are a Jesus follower, there's more, okay? Because for those of us who are Christians, the problem with being mastered by anything is that we already have a master. We have made a decision to submit all of our lives to our Savior, Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. Now, we don't like the word master because it conjures up ideas and images of slavery. But let me just ask you a quick question. If being trapped and controlled by something isn't slavery, what is it? I mean, think about the monkey tied to the tree. Like, what else do you call that if it isn't being enslaved? If you can't let go or if you refuse to let go, whatever it is, that, that thing that's influencing and controlling your life and impacting your life and, and damaging your life and, and causing you to experience things you never wanted or intended to experience, and what started off as a pastime has become a pathway, and now it's difficult to let it go and walk away? I mean, if that's not slavery, what is it? Now, the Apostle Paul actually talks about this dynamic in a letter he wrote to Christians living in Rome. And he uses this image of slavery, which would have been very familiar to them. Some of them had been slaves. Some of them had owned slaves. And maybe some of them still owned slaves. That was a common part of life in the Roman world. And so he uses this metaphor of slavery in his letter to these Jesus followers living in Rome. And he starts out this way in Romans 6. He says, don't you know? Like, this should be self-evident. This is common knowledge, don't you know? But maybe you've never really sat down and thought about it like this. So, so he starts out, don't you know? And then he, he states something that's so obvious, it shouldn't even need to be said, but it sets him up for uh, where he's going. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone or, or something, as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. In other words, when you stuck your hand in there and, and, and you got tied to and roped to and chained to something and you refused to let go, you're obeying that thing. You're obeying that, that dynamic or that habit, that pastime, that pathway, whatever it might be. And when you obey it, you make yourself a slave to it. Whatever you say yes to, or, or whoever you say yes to, to the degree that they're controlling your behavior, that thing or that person has become your master. If you're thinking, wow, I never thought of it that way, that's why he started off with, don't you know? Because we don't think about it that way. And he's like, well, you need to think about it that way, because in a minute, I'm going to challenge you to let go. But I want you to understand what's at stake. See, this is a big deal. He goes on, he says, when you are, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, and I'll explain that in a minute, which leads to death, or obedience to God, which leads to righteousness. Now, let me define sin for you. We, we overcomplicate it a lot. So, sin is so simple to understand, we almost don't want to understand it on purpose. Because sin in the New Testament is just this. It's anything that hurts you. Anything that hurts you and anything that hurts the people around you, the, the people you live with, the people you're raising, the people you married, uh, the person you hope to marry, uh, the people you work with, any, anything that, that hurts people you don't even know, that's a sin. And the Bible tells us that God so loved the world. And he's not talking about the planet. He's talking about the people. God so loved the people. God so loved the people around you. God so loved you. And when you love someone and someone hurts someone that you love, you consider it wrong. And so God says, I'm calling that sin. When you hurt you who God loves, and when you hurt other people whom God loves, that's a sin. You don't even have to have a list of rules and regulations. It's real simple. Any behavior that undermines you or the people around you is sin, and you shouldn't do it. And here's why. Paul says sin leads to death. See, sin actually kills things. Sin kills things. Sin kills relationships. Sin kills careers. Sin destroys the person you see in the mirror. Sin kills your confidence. Sin can kill your health. Sin can actually kill your financial security, right? 
If you, if you have a bad habit or you're just irresponsible or you ignore all the good advice and just do whatever it is you want to do, you've seen that happen or maybe you've experienced it. And you know what else sin kills? Sin kills your peace. And again, this isn't necessarily even a Christian thing. Sin kills your peace with other people that you've sinned against. And sin kills your, your peace with God because of your conscience, which bothers you. And, and sin actually kills your relationship with you because of who you begin to see in the mirror. So, of course, God, who has invited you to address him as Heavenly Father, God, who loves you so much that he sent his Son into the world to pay for your sin so that you could have life and peace and relationships, of course, God is against sin. Not, not because he's against you. God's against sin because he's for you. And God is for the people around you. Sin kills things. But, and here's the application part, obedience actually makes things right. Now, we don't like the word obedience because it seems limiting to us, seems kind of constrictive. But it's actually freeing because it frees us from the repercussions and the consequences of sin. When we obey, we can live with a clear conscience knowing we did the right thing. You can go to bed at night and look at the ceiling and go, you know what, I, I did the right thing today. On the other hand, there are a few things that will tear at your soul more than facing yourself in the mirror in the morning going like, you know what, I was a coward. I lied. I deceived. I gossiped. I acted selfishly. I did the wrong thing to protect myself. And then you give yourself 25 reasons why, why you needed to do that. But at the end of the day, sin has taken its toll on your soul. So God, who loves you, is saying, like, come on. Sin kills things. But obedience makes things right. Obedience to God sets things right between you and God and between you and others and between you and, and you. Paul keeps going. He says, he says, but, because there's a contrast here, he says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, although in the past you had your hand in the coconut and you wouldn't let go, you have come to not just believe, because believing alone doesn't make much difference, but you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. And when he uses that phrase, pattern of teaching, Paul's talking about a, a pattern of thinking or a way of thinking based on what God has done for us in Jesus. As a result, we see the world differently and we see ourselves and we see the people around us differently. We see God differently. And not only do we see differently, we, we do differently because of what God has done for us. We're to do the same for others. We're to treat others the way that God, through Christ, has treated us. It's a, a pattern for thinking and living that's going to change everything. And it will compel you to finally let go of the things that are keeping you back and weighing you down. Because his overarching command is tied to his extraordinary gift. We are to love because we are loved. And when that becomes the driving force of our life, anything that I realize is not good for you and I realize is not good for me, it just becomes off limits. What he's saying is obedience frees you, doesn't enslave you. Obedience frees you from the complications and ultimately the consequences of sin. Now, Paul takes this same idea and does a deeper dive in his letter to the Jesus followers in Corinth. He starts out the same way. Do you not know? I, I, do you not know? I, I, once again, like I don't know if you already know this, but if you don't know, you need to know that your bodies are temples. What's a temple? Well, a temple is a sacred site. That's the way they thought about it in the first century, that a temple is where heaven meets earth. And the Apostle Paul says, exactly. God has done something radically new. And from now on, because of what God has done, you and the people around you are, are more sacred than any temple or any sacred site that you've ever visited or even heard of. God has done something so radical that people have actually become more sacred than sacred sites. Do you not know that your bodies are temples? Why? Because they're filled with the Holy Spirit who is in you. 
Paul says, don't misunderstand me. I didn't say you were sacred because of your behavior. I said you're sacred because of who lives inside of you. He says, and here's the implication of that. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God resides in you. And as a result, you are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You were bought at a price. You were bought and paid for by somebody else. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, you belong to him. You don't belong to yourself. He owns you because he paid for you. Now, that sounds kind of offensive to us, but it's because we don't know what our price was. When I was growing up, my family used to collect different things. I like to collect stuff. My dad collected Coca-Cola memorabilia. I collected Star Trek items and books and comic books. And, and we'd go to lots of garage sales and flea markets together. And sometimes we'd look for items to buy in order to resell them later on. So I'd often ask my dad, like, well, how much is that worth? Like, what's the value? And my dad would put it this way. He said, it's only worth what someone will pay for it. And he was just teaching me some basic economics. And that's the perceived value of a thing is what it'll bring. The perceived value, not the actual value, because there is no actual value. There's only perceived value. For instance, water costs a lot more in some parts of the world than other parts of the world. Why is that? Well, it's because of the perceived value of the water. In fact, that's true of any product. The perceived value of a thing is what it'll bring. That's how you determine the price of something, is what it actually brings. Perceived value determines the price a person is willing to pay. So what happens when things don't sell in a store? They drop the price. They keep dropping the price until it gets to a point where people perceive that the price and the value line up. Now, here's what's amazing. You were purchased and there was a price put on you. And the price determines your value in the eyes of God. The price that God paid for you and for me was his son. By sending his son to pay for my sin, he expressed a value and and placed a value on me that I can't even begin to imagine. You were purchased with the blood of God's son. God's son gave his life for you. So question, what has the thing that you're clinging to offered for you? What has the thing that you won't let go of sacrificed for you? What price has that thing paid in order to benefit you? The truth is, it's costing you. Paul says, why allow something to be my master that's actually hurting me and the people that I love? He says, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. And then he gives us the punchline, the the application. Therefore, therefore, means, hey, in, in light of everything I've said so far, here's what, I, here's what I want you not to believe. Here's what I want you to do. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Therefore, with, with, in everything you do with your body and in all your behavior, in all your relationships, in every decision you make, I want you to honor God with your behavior. What does that look like? Well, it's very simple. We honor God by honoring those God honors. When you're hanging on to something that demeans you or creates a lack of dignity in you or expresses a lack of dignity or worth in other people, you have to let go because that's not honoring God. And it's overlooking and and missing what the incredible, incredible price that God paid for you so that you could have a relationship with him. Anything that gets in the way of my love for you needs to be moved out of the way. And anything that gets in the way of your love for other people needs to be moved out of the way. It's in the way. So back to our original question. What are you holding on to that's holding you back? What are you holding on to that's holding you back from being able to have a clear conscience with your Father in heaven? What are you holding on to that's holding you back from having the relationship you always dreamed of with your children or with your spouse. What are you holding on to that's holding you back? Is it your anger? 
Is it a habit? You know, habits don't start as habits. Habits start as, oh, oh that would be fun. That, that'd be nice. Everybody else is doing that. It's, it's just a pastime. And then over time, you realize it's, it's a pathway. And suddenly you're a slave. And you don't want to spend another year being a slave to something that's weighing you down, right? It may be, and this is the hardest one, it, it may be the thing that's holding you back is not a thing, it's, it's a person, it's somebody. Maybe, maybe it's a friend or a group of friends or a romantic relationship that's dragging you down. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your Father in Heaven. And you owe it to your future you to just let it go. Maybe it's a form of entertainment. Maybe it's gaming or it's alcohol. Maybe you've been ignoring your health. Maybe it's something you own. Maybe it's something you do. You've been bought with a price. God loves you and he's inviting you to a way of life where you set down every single thing that burdens you or, or trips you up or, or slows you down so that you can be fully his because you already have a master. Now, if you really want to get serious about this, which you probably don't, but as long as we're talking about it, if you really want to have an awkward but powerful start to this year, just ask someone, am I holding on to something that's holding me back? Because the people closest to you and the people who love you most, they know the answer to this question. Am I holding on to something that's holding me back? And if so, just let it go. Because you don't have any business being mastered by anything or anyone. If you're a Jesus follower, you already have a master. A master who demonstrated. He didn't just talk about it. He demonstrated his love for you in this. That while you were still a sinner, while you were still hanging on stuff that was holding you back, while you were still ignoring people and being unkind to people because it suited you and because it benefited you, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for your sin. He gave his life for you. And then he's invited you to follow him. If you're not a Jesus follower, come on, you should be. Take a step. Get some questions answered. Read a book. Sign on again. Watch next week. Just, just take a step. You should consider it. Or if you kind of slacked off, maybe you should reconsider following him. You've lived long enough to know that what I've said is true, that sin kills things. In fact, let's just be super personal about it. Like, if you had been following Jesus a year ago or three years ago, five years ago, whatever it is, you may have avoided your greatest regret. If you had been following Jesus in that season of your life, you may have never stuck your hand in the jar and taken hold of that shiny thing to begin with. So, in addition to letting go of what's holding you back, I hope you will take hold of the one who brought you back and bought you back, who will lead you to the life that he describes as abundant, extraordinary life that's truly life. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you loved us so much that you paid the price to buy us back. And Lord, for those of us who call you Father, who call you Lord, you, you, you're our master. Father, we have no business being slaves to anyone or anything else. Lord, just help us to look at our lives, to see what there might be that we just need to let go of. And then God helps to take hold of you so that you can lead us into the life that you promised us. Father, we love you. We thank you. Now we ask for wisdom to know what step you want us to take next. And give us the courage to take that step. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.